morning, everybody. Good morning. <clears throat> this is Mike Zupko. I think I, I don't know who all we have on, but I'm sure if you got my email, you've probably gotten an email from me before, and I probably know uh, most of the folks out there. But just in terms of introduction and to keep us uh, keep us on schedule, we're going to go get, go ahead and get started, even though uh, we still have some folks uh, joining. But for those that for, for those that don't know me, uh, I represent the Southern Governors Association and serve as chair of the Southern Regional Strategy Committee, I'm a part of the National Cohesive Wildland Fire Management Strategy, um, and part of the part of the process that uh, we've been working on for the past, you know, two to three years. I'm going to go through kind of a uh, introduction here, but first I want to hit on some administrative items. As soon as I'm done talking, because I'm not in the room with the uh, with the other presenters, they're going to place the phone line on mute. That way, we won't have any problems with uh, you know with background noise or keyboards or paper ru paper rustling or anything like that. So, um, if you do have questions, use the Q and A uh, section on the WebEx. I think at least for mine, you have to click on that drop down box and then um, go to the chat box uh, and find it there. I believe that's correct. Um, we are going to be recording the audio, or we are recording the audio of this, and we will have the presentations available um, afterwards, so we'll package those together, and if there's other folks within your agencies or other folks that you've talked to that were not able to make it on today, um, we'll make sure we have that available. We are also, uh, depending on um, hearing from some other folks, we're considering doing another uh, another webinar. So. Uh, we'll let folks know if we end up doing another one, but like I said, we will have it um, recorded and available for folks to look at. And last thing is, if you have any technical issues, if you've been able to get on the phone but um, have an issue with your WebEx or something else, um, you can go to krogers at unca.edu, and she will um, she'll work on that kind of in the background while, uh, while we're going through the rest of the presentation. All right, Karen? So just a. Uh, Did you go through two? Yeah, she skipped. You went two. <laughs> just a brief overview of what we're going to do today. I'm going to give a, a real quick overview, background of the cohesive strategy, just to give us some context, and then we're going to turn it over to Danny Lee, who's going to go through the data that's been compiled. And again, this this webinar is focused on kind of the data and the science background that um, that we have, and how we can all use that. So. We'll dive into that and dive into some of the national uh, options and priorities that have been developed through uh, the use of the data. We'll have a roadmap of kind of the tools that are that are out there, or the primary tool that we're using, and how that can be used. And then we'll talk about the workshops to where um, we'll be able to offer training where folks, um, you know, ind individual agencies and organizations can send um, some folks to learn more about this. So it's kind of an overview of what we'll be doing uh, today. I'm going to jump in real quick to kind of a background on the cohesive strategy. Um, I know many of you all know this, but in case we have some folks that aren't as familiar with it, uh, basically, you know, to me, the co cohesive strategy is an enhanced way of collaborating and working together to address issues that uh, and challenges that surround wildland fire. It stemmed from 2009 federal legislation that intended to uh, you can go to the next slide, Karen. Intended to address the issue with how wildland fire is funded nationally, which I think many of you all know is uh, the only natural disaster that's really handled differently than the rest of them. Um, it's a multi-phase, or has been a multi-phase approach. We're actually in the in phase three right now uh, that allowed for and encouraged regional flexibility um, while also setting some some national priorities. So. You know, it's been, uh, at least for me, uh, being a part of it since essentially the beginning, it really has given the regions uh, flexibility in defining what our key issues are and how we want to address those. So um, I think that's been something a little unique from some past national strategies that have been, you know, completely national, top-down. Um, we've, we've had a lot of flexibility there. Okay, next slide. There are, like I mentioned, kind of the national priorities and national goals. Um, the three that you all have heard before and know, but just to review, restore and maintain landscapes, uh, build fire-adapted human communities, and I, I'd like to insert that word human in there to remind us that's what we're talking about, where people meet, meet the forest, 
And then the last one is, you know, building efficient and effective wildfire response. We're building upon what we what we have um, in the south already. We Okay, next slide. Um, like I said, this was going to be a real brief overview. Um, I'm not going to go into this slide in depth other than to say, you know, the the use of data and the use of science in this process um, is has been a big part of it. And it's really helped us inform the process uh, when we built it in the region. And now at the national level, it's really helping more than just inform it, but it's helping drive some of these priorities. Um, it, to me, it's a huge opportunity for us to, to take some of the information that's been out there, uh, but really be able to mix and match it in a way we've not been able to before or, or really haven't gone into this depth. To me, it's kind of the intent is to offer um, you know, training again back to the regional and state uh, folks and, and managers at different levels that let you build this kind of network uh, structure uh, to learn from. The, what we want to get through today is that, you know, through is understanding the, the science backbone of all this that can help us all become more informed decision makers and have the ability to, um, I use this slide as an example, we're going to go to in-depth into some more, but uh, to help understand what the arrows are, what the, what the data is connecting some of these arrows, and, and how we move that forward. Okay, next slide, Karen. This is, uh, some of us have seen this before, and, and a few of us uh, understand it, <laughs> but at the end of the day, hopefully, and I'm not going to attempt to explain it because we're going to spend the next hour and a half, two hours on this, but you'll have a good handle of how we get from the beginning of this, what's behind those uh, cream or gray colored boxes, and how that moves through, to, through in helping us make some decisions um, and helping us prioritize and, and helping both collectively and individually um, us better understanding what's going on in the landscape and what we can do to impact that. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the folks that have um, built this and that can explain it and that are really the, the brains of this operation here. Uh, I'm just uh, sometimes the face and the mouth, but these are the folks that have spent a lot of time on it. Uh, Danny Lee, I think, is, or Danny Lee is going to go first. I think many of us know him in the south. He's with the Southern Research Station um, out of Asheville, but he has been leading the national science team on the development of this. Uh, Jim Fox is the director, uh, uh, and I've, I apologize, Jim, of NEMAC <laughs> in UNC Asheville. And it's a, um, I meant to write it down, but I didn't write it down, so I'll let you, when you talk, <laughs> introduce NEMAC. But Jim Fox and his team, including Karen Rogers, have been a large part of the development working with Danny on this. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over. Um, Karen's going to mute the telephone for us so we don't have distractions, and uh, we'll go from there, and we will have some time for Q&A at the end, but if you think of things along the way, go ahead and throw them in the, uh, in the questions box, and, we'll go, and they'll capture those as we go along. So with that, I'll turn it over to Danny. Thanks. Before you mute, Karen, maybe it would be good to just sort of quickly check and make sure everybody, the technology is working for everybody. So if anybody has, um, is out there and, and wants, needs some last minute or have some last minute questions about the technology. Okay. All right. Well, uh, Karen's going to be tracking, sort of uh, watching it. All participants are now in listen-only mode. Okay. All right. So, um, so as Mike said, I'm going to going to kick it off here. We've got a lot of, of information, a lot of analysis that's been done uh, over the last several years. Uh, where I'm going to start with today, though, is to give folks a little better insight into um, the analysis behind what we're calling the national analysis. And this is kind of like the tail end of phase three, and it, it really builds upon all of the things that have been done up until now. Um, we were uh, sort of given a special assignment I'll talk about in just a few minutes over the last, really it's been about the last 11 months or so. And so um, a lot of the information is now beginning to, to go out. We've got this exercise with the southeast here where we're trying to uh, work more directly with the users. It, it really is a new phase in the cohesive strategy. And so while some of you have seen 
uh, some of the information I'm going to talk about, the way it's being used, and particularly the way it's been used in terms of developing a national strategy, is somewhat, uh, well, it is. It's different, and it's a, it's a new twist on what we've done before. Um, that said, I think as we, as we move into beginning to pick up this information and apply it in the different regions, uh, a lot of the, the kind of the, um, how to say it, the tricks we've learned in doing the national analysis are going to come to, to, to be of use to you, I think, in a regional sort of planning exercises, and that's, that's what we're really trying to introduce. The way the workshop is set up this morning is I'm going to give a, a really sort of rapid and, and uh, superficial overview of the entire process. Uh, we're going to get into to some of the components of that in more detail over the next hour or two. But even then, we're still not going to do the deep dive into the data and to all of the, the bits and pieces. There are some upcoming workshops that will that'll go through a session of, of looking more closely at the information and understanding the tools better. Okay, so apparently I have a mouse. Let's see if that does change do anything. Huh? There we go. Oh, the wheel does it? Oh, that's right. Okay. All right, so Mike's already hit upon the three goals. I um, always like to sort of remind ourselves that, that this is kind of where we start, is start at the sort of the broadest level, and let's, let's not lose sight of what it is we're trying to accomplish, uh, looking at, at landscapes, communities, and response. Um, for us, in the, the most recent exercise, I mentioned this national analysis, and, and really where this came from was, was that um, last year, sort of last calendar year, we were, we were wrapping up kind of what you might call the first part of phase three, where we participated and worked with the different regions. Uh, we brought a lot of information, sort of, if you will, pulled up a big truck and dumped it on the regions and said, you know, here it all is, uh, see what you can do with it. and and to their credit, they did a lot, uh, but they didn't go as far maybe as, as, as we had hoped to, particularly within the regions, and, and certainly we weren't able to go as far as we wanted to in terms of providing a, a national overview. And so the, the Wildland Fire Executive Council and others sort of gave us a new charge, or at least gave a new charge to the science team. And so what they said is they wanted to explore some of the potential national policy options that could achieve the goal and look at it from a national perspective. And then what we wanted to do is provide a broad kind of strategic overview of the challenges and opportunities that could be used to inform those discussions at the national level. Now we completed a lot of our work this summer, uh, made a presentation to the executives back in June. And at that point, I think we got a very positive reception to the work we had done, but it, like lots of other things in the Kuisa strategy, it was sort of like, yes, but can you go a little bit further? Um, the little bit further they wanted us to do was to try to use that information and lay out some potential strategic options, that, or excuse me, strategic prioritization. So given all of the options you've laid in front of us, how would we put them together and sort of identify some priorities? Can we reduce even more um, the information to something that's, that's a little bit more more packaged, if you will? And so we did that too, and then most recently, even, even as of yesterday afternoon, uh, we were putting the finishing touches on what's called the National a strategy document that is, is going forward now for the executive's consideration and many of you will be seeing it again I think looking at some of the names of the participants I think many of you have already seen earlier versions of it and we've tried to respond to many of the, the excellent comments that have come back on that. The whole point of, of both the national analysis, the national strategy and even the efforts of the regions that are going through right now is as Mike suggested it's time to move from the goals and and sort of the aspirations of the cohesive strategy into action. What is it we're going to do? Who's going to do it? Where we're going to do it? And that we're hoping that the kind of the information we're bringing forward can help with that with that conversation. Now, when you start looking at, at wildland fire from a national level, um, you immediately realize that this is a big hairy problem, right? I mean, wildland fire is a complex issue. There are lots of interacting factors and processes. Um, the United States is a very dynamic and diverse landscape. There is no sort of single characterization or solution that's universally appropriate. That is, we can't just sort of say, oh, here's the wildland fire problem and here's how you fix it. 
run out there and apply that everywhere. Because every, every situation, every landscape, every little piece of the landscape in some way has its own kind of unique history and, and sets of issues in that. And so it, it's very hard to, to say that, well, there's just sort of a kind of a general solution here. On the other hand, um, we have to have some level of generalization, simplification, consolidation, whatever term you want to come up with, um, that reduces things to sort of a more manageable number of narratives, as I describe it, or sets of prescriptions, where you can say, you know, may not, everything may be unique, but there's enough commonality, enough similarity there that we can take advantage of that and develop a set of prescriptions that could be tailored to the different types of landscapes and the general characteristics, and then still use that then to sort of filter down, get down to the finer level and where the the, uh, the individual sort of management actions can be tailored to what's going on. Uh, we, we don't want a national cohesive strategy that basically says everybody's got their own problem, so deal with it. All right, so what have we been doing uh, in terms of meeting at the analytical challenge? Uh, it's been ref made reference to before about the large number of data sets that have been assembled. Uh, these we've been working on for about three years now of of trying to tap into every sort of uh, data set that might be relevant. Uh, we've, we've uh, in some sense, tried to, to adjust an elephant kind of here uh, with a lot of different information. So there's a lot of multiple data sets. They span the range of biophysical, social, economic factors in addition to all of the sort of usual wild and fire statistics that we've seen. We've, we've um, used a variety of, of uh, statistical and geospatial techniques to try to try to um, distill that information, if you will, to sort of create a nationally consistent what we'll call a classification system, and you'll see that in a little bit, little bit later as so we talk more about it. Um, that that sort of distilled version of the of the truth, if you will, is being used to try to, to line up with the different policy or management options in order to sort of see, well, we've got some major challenges. How is it we would address them and how would we address them differentially across the country? And then finally, there's an ex exercise sort of ongoing that's really bigger than just the science team of beginning to sort of blend the management options with sort of the institutions that are out there and to be able to sort of say not only here's what we'd like to do but here's who's going to do it and why there it's important that they sort of take a lead role in this and so forth and that and that really involves the larger cohesive strategy governance. All right, so so on to the to sort of the analytical process that we're using. Uh, we start off with what I'm calling the national characterization. Uh, we build upon, again, the, the information that's been used. If you, if you pick up any of the regional um, uh, assessment reports from the earlier part of Phase 3, they have a pretty good description of, of the regional issues. Uh, some of that information has been summarized in what's coming forward in sort of the national uh, report. Uh, but there's also is a national characterization where we, in a sense, have, have dissolved those regional boundaries and tried to look across the United States and try to look for for similarities. So we use county level data uh, and various sort of statistical data and uh, statistical techniques. And when I say county level data, what I really mean is county, county level summaries. As, as many of you know, a lot of the data that's out there is much higher or finer resolution. Uh, some of it goes down to individual incidents, some goes down to, to individual locations. Some of it is, is more broadly, it, you know, census blocks and stuff like that. In order to pull all of this stuff together, we've, we've had to consolidate to sort of a uniform measuring standard or, or unit of measurement, and so that's been the county level that we've used. And in many cases, we've then tried to normalize those variables within the county so that they're expressed on a per unit area or per capita basis or some other kind of normalization standard. So the size of the county is not really a big determinant in terms of the values that you get. Um, we, we've taken that data set and, like I've said, using, using different techniques, we've created the classification system. We want to classify counties into subsets that share common characteristics relative to sort of two principal goals that I'm going to talk about, uh, the first being landscape resiliency and the second being community protection. 
Um, we're going to use the characteristics of, of each group of counties then to help to sort of tailor the management options and the priorities. And as you'll see, we'll actually find that it's the juxtaposition of landscape and communities that tells us the most about what's going, going on. So how does, how does this work? Well, let's talk about landscape resiliency for a minute and the classification. So, so a lot of discussion and use of the word resiliency, a lot of debate, if you will, about exactly what it means, how do you measure it, how do you know whether you've got a resilient landscape or not. Um, I would sort of say that a lot of that is, is, is intellectually interesting. I'm not sure it's particularly uh, essential to the, to the conversations we want to have. Uh, at its core, resiliency is about sustainability and it's sort of the resistance to or recovery from disturbance. Uh, we know that landscapes are complex intersections of natural, built, and human components, and it's the processes among these components, it's the interactions of those that gives rise to this idea of a resilient landscape. Um, the summary data that we have are insufficient to sort of accurately measure that resiliency because we don't really know a lot about sort of the processes themselves. But at the same time, the county level summary data are indicative of the issues and the processes in play. In other words, we see the, we see the uh, effect of the processes even if we don't understand them directly or can't quantify them directly enough. We can sort of tell that, okay, this is what's going on. These are the issues that are in play here and these are the things that need to be addressed. And so what we're really saying when we start sort of divvying up the country is we're saying here are, here are counties that are, are sufficiently similar to one another in terms of some of the basic sort of attributes that are, are driving or are important in this issue that you're going to have a similar con conservation there. It won't be the identical um, excuse me, conversation, uh, but it'll be a similar enough that, that where we can sort of talk to, okay, you're going to have to deal with sort of this set of issues or that set of issues or whatever, and so this is sort of the point of the classification system. Now what we've used for, for landscape resiliency is something called classification tree. Um, let's see, I guess, can I see the little hand? Do you see the little hand, Matt? Okay, so, so the idea is you sort of take all of the counties, you throw them in a big hopper, and you immediately start looking at individual variables and sort of splitting off, you know, certain counties that have uh, various characteristics based upon that single variable. So the first thing that we notice, I mean, we actually try to write a different classification trees, and one of the things we found is that invariably we ended up sort of grouping urban counties together in different ways. So well, why do we throw urban in there at the first? So well, how about we split off those counties that have high urban values because the discussion about resiliency in a sort of a highly urban county is going to be different than it is in really in any other county. Take what's left then and start looking at them. And one of the things that, that comes into the fire is well, what's the sort of historical role of fire in that landscape? I mean, is it, is it this, this category that we call the fire regime group five, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but any of you know what that means. These are the places that historically burn sort of most infrequently, um, although when they did burn, and they're likely to have burned at sort of a mix of severity levels depending on a particular type of vegetation that you were in. But the, but the reality is, is that fire wasn't a big part of that landscape historically other than sort of a, um, sort of a rare episodic event that tended to reset the, uh, the vegetation in some way. But in general, you know, you wouldn't be expected to find lots of fire adapted uh, ecosystems or species in that in this fire regime group five uh, counties. And when you look at the distribution of those counties that fall within that, what we find is, is that there's, there's a big group of them in sort of the, uh, uh, the cooler, wetter, northeastern part of the country. And then there's some other other counties falling into that predominantly in the west and one can make a sort of a valid argument that the western counties themselves could have probably been split into into additional groups as well but we didn't want to sort of have too many uh, different splits out there so that's where we end up going and we go through different kinds of, of pathways we look at the amount of we split off the forested areas from sort of the non-forested areas we, we look at sort of federal ownership we looked at at the different regions, we looked at where prescribed fires taken place and so forth and so on. And so, so what we ended up then with are these sort of 11 classes just sort of nominally uh, identified as from, from A to, to K 
decay. Um, and then we went in and started looking more closely as well. What is it that that's going on with these uh, with these counties? How is it we would characterize it? Um, we looked to at sort of the, the geographical distribution of those. And so so if you sort of you know quickly glance up there and don't pay too much attention to what the different colors mean, um, you can see a sort of a strong geographical affinity there. For for some of that, that's because we split them out based on which region there is. But for the most part, it's because the, the basic biophysical setting of the sort of conterminous United States sets you up for certain kinds of conditions. It, it, it imparts a fairly you know, specific sort of level of constraint on the kinds of vegetation that's there, the climatic systems that are there, the settlement patterns that are there, so forth and so on. All of these things have affected us. And so they've, they've created these sorts of unique um, uh, combinations of, of variables, if you will, patterns that we see out there. Uh, so we can see, so we can generate maps. We can also generate various kinds of summary uh, tables. And this is probably the, the most reduced summary table that we have. We've got other things that, that we'll look at in, in sort of upcoming workshops in that. But this is kind of like the little consumer reports table that some of you may, may have seen where the sort of the solid dots uh, indicator solid circles and they very high um, relative to the national level the the open or the low and in the moderate and higher there in between <clears throat> we won't go through these too much but the point if you if you sort of quickly skim up through there you can see that that there is a distinctive pattern for every landscape class that we have there are differences between these classes and those differences are manifest upon a different sets of variables which have different implications for what's going on in that landscape. And we'll, we'll talk more about this as we move on. Um, OK, let's see. So moving on, moving on to, to community protection and, and uh, thinking about that, sort of a basic conceptual model that we did in thinking about, about risk to communities. We think about the intersections of wildfire at its occurrence and extent with our homes and communities. But we also want to think about the social component of that. That there's a there's a dimension of of kind of um, vulnerability, if you will, that has to do with sort of the resources of the people themselves, and we want to include that in our analysis. We actually used uh, 17 different variables to get at this, but we went through a series of, of again statistical processes to reduce that to six factor or six variables that we used. Uh, two of them having to do with with the area burned and the amount, the number of the fires, so we look at ignition density and area burn. Uh, two other, which are, are factor scores that have to do with the uh, kind of the footprint of the WUI and the concentration of homes within that. So we have something that sort of allows us to array uh, communities based upon sort of the exposure of the homes within the wildland uh, urban interface, um, and then two factors which have to deal with sort of the the uh, demographic or socioeconomic advantages that some communities have over another, and it, and by the sort of the counterpart to that, although it's not completely complementary, is the level of demographic stress within those community, uh, communities based upon things like unemployment and income and education and stuff like that. So then we you know throw this into our statistical uh, hopper, if you will, come out with eight community clusters. Um, this is maybe a little bit bit um, difficult to sort of pick up on, but, but you can see here is, is that we, we have, much as we did with the landscape classes, we have some geographical affinity of those community clusters, although it's not nearly as strong as it was with the landscape classes, because there are communities in the west that look an awful lot like communities in the southeast and in the northeast and, and so forth and so on. In fact, we we can find most of these community clusters distributed across multiple sort of sections of the country, which sort of tells us that in terms of the community structure, it looks very much like um, other parts of the country, uh, even though they're, they're sort of widely dispersed. Well, we can do the same thing with, with it that we've done, we did with the landscape classes in terms of developing these little summary statistics and looking at that and again, assigning names to the different community clusters. So you can see we've got a southern rule and a western rule um, clusters, you know, two and three. We've got a, a, 
Uh, our disadvantaged communities are showing out highly in six and, and suburbs in seven and eight and so forth. And so, so all of these things, you know, the handles are always that we assign to them or the labels are always somewhat inaccurate and, and incomplete, but at least they give us a way of, of kind of forming a mental model of the kinds of communities that we're talking about. And again, the real characterization comes in the variables themselves and telling us what's going on and what, what it is we're seeing in those communities. Okay, so we've got two classification systems. What happens if you intersect them and put them together? Well, uh, Karen, I lost. Yeah, so if you, if you put them together, then what we find, is interestingly, is that just about all of the combinations occur somewhere throughout the country. They're, they're sort of the number of kind of blank cells in this table, if you will, is relatively small, um, but there's a, there's a fairly wide widespread across through there. There obviously are some combinations that occur in much greater numbers than others or some that are relatively rare, um, some, you know, re reflected only by a single county. Um, we can look for, you know, sort of create measures of association between one, between a community cluster and a landscape classes. Essentially what you're seeing in those sort of combinations that are highlighted in green, these are, are associations or combinations that occurred um, to levels that are at least twice as great as we would have expected by chance alone. That is, if these two things are independent and you sort of spread them across the country proportionately, um, you would have expected sort of a, you know, a certain kind of, of numbers of occurrences in every cell. You compare that expected number to what you actually see and you get these, these areas shaded in green which are just telling us, for example, that just sort of looking at the first row, that the landscape class A, which is our more urban uh, landscape type, falls more heavily or, or tends to have a greater level of association with community cluster 7 and 8, which we saw were, were more of our urban and suburban uh, categories. And you can go down through there and so see things, you know, like, like um, community cluster five with uh, landscape class D, you know, having a high level of association and so forth. And so, so we, we are gonna, we're going to use this and we're going to talk a lot about this over the, over the coming sets of workshops because we'll be interested in the particular attributes of each particular combination. And in fact, the, the gang here with NEMAC and and ourselves have gone through and, and went through the exercise of looking at every single combination, thinking about, you know, what it is, where it occurs, what are some of the attributes of it, what are some of the options that, that we'll talk about later, how do they apply to these different uh, combinations, and even how would the national priorities play out in each combination. And we're going to, uh, Jim, I think, is going to talk more about that in the next section, and then whatever questions Jim doesn't answer, we're going to let we're going to let Karen and Matt answer for us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so what? How do we use this? I mean, what's the point of having all of this information? Well, we we sort of go back up and say, well, we've got some national challenges we need to deal with. We're going to be, begin to thinking about, you know, how we sort of address them, what their options are. We go through a process of starting with a simple conceptual understanding of the issue, look at some of the key components that are there, think about the management options that are specific to the different themes, and then we're going to line these up. We're going to line up the options with the combinations and, and classes and clusters and, and other information that we have and begin to map these things out. So Mike showed one of our simpler conceptual models that we use. Here's another one that we've, we've used rather extensively just so that thinking about, well, think about an individual fire. There are a couple of things that affect whether it even occurs or not in ignition. Uh, you've got weather and terrain. You can't do a whole lot about those things to sort of work with those. You can do, you have fuels that comes into the problem. Uh, you can do something about that. You've got your suppression effect. Um, those are sort of the five factors that, that influence extent and intensity. Whether or not you have, have any kind of effect of those fire, I mean, at that point, it's just sort of a fire. Whether or not it has consequences really depends on what kind of exposure that you have. Um, and so we try to, to, to think about the exposure of the resources to the fire, put the exposure together with the, the fire, and that gives us sort of the net change in values that we're interested in. Well, you don't have to understand this, this graphic too, 
to weld on appreciate that in some sense it's a simple caricature for the wildland fire issue itself across the country and the four kind of major categories of things that we we concern ourselves with have to do with fuel treatments, prevention programs, response, and exposure, um, along with um, you know some other kind of minor effects. But in terms of the national challenges, they're there. So so we've we've identified really five categories, and part of this is going back and looking at what the regions did, but sort of grouping up the things that are there. So we vegetation and fuels, home communities of other values at risk, human ignition or human cost ignition, response, and then a fifth one which has to do with administrative efficiency. A lot of, lot of uh, discussion about how we coordinate among entities, how we work together, how we collaborate, and stuff like that. We didn't analyze those uh, any options having to do with administrative efficiency in the national analysis, but we did look at these other sort of four issues. And our process for doing that, and I'll only illustrate kind of with one, Let's start with vegetation and fuels and try to think about, about that issue. And I'm not going to give you a lot of details on this. It's both in a national report that's coming out and it'll be described in greater detail in the, sort of the report of the science team uh, probably early next year that'll be released. Um, but we, you know, I can give you a sense of how we've looked at this. So thinking about vegetation, we've mentioned fire, re, fire regime groups. Uh, we have some historical information about that. The idea that you know, groups one and two are the more frequent, uh, lower severity fires. Three and four are the more moderate frequency, and the combination of sort of mixed or low severity versus sort of a higher severity replacement. And then then five. Again, I think most of you are familiar with these types. You look at the distribution across the United States, and it very much sort of follows the kind of ecophysical um, uh, landscapes that are there. But there's also the influence of, of sort of pre-European uh, human patterns of burning and things like that are reflected in there. Uh, for the southeast that we're primarily targeting today, you know, we're really looking at, at essentially fire regime groups one and two that dominate the landscape, quite a bit of three sort of scattered in many of the sort of the lowland uh, wetter areas and even some uh, five in the, in the very wettest uh, landscape. Um, if you look nationwide, oops, excuse me, getting ahead of myself. Um, if you think of, think nationwide about, okay, so historically that's what we had in uh, uh, what are, what's going on now? And I just sort of use this as a graphic to sort of point out of all that we have lots of different information that we can use about where fires occur, how large they uh, occur, where they burn, when they burn, all of this sort of stuff. And so the, the general pattern that we see is, you know, lots of smaller fires in the southeast and, and sort of the, the central plains and then an aggregation of fires with larger fires occurring in the west, uh, occurring in different seasons as well. This tells us something about, well, how has the, the current fire regime departed from the historical fire regime? What does that tell us about possible patterns in, in fuels? Um, here's a graphic that, that I find very insightful, but I have a hard time sort of explaining to folks why it means anything. Um, but basically, the, the, the short, uh, short story here is, is that we're comparing the area burned currently in the red versus the land area in blue for the different fire re regime groups. And if we were burning in the same sort of historical patterns that we had before, the red bars for fire regime groups one and two would be much higher than the blue bars. Um, and the, the red bars for three, four, and five would be just the opposite. So the red bars would be much lower, the blue bars would be much higher. What we see is, is that these red bars are pretty much proportional to the to land area. So the area burned in, in fire regime one and two is pretty much proportional to the land area in those landscapes. That suggests that we've got, we, we essentially have much less fire in those landscapes than we did historically. Three and four are interesting in that they are not the same um, because we would have expected them to essentially look much the same. Uh, which kind of implies that we're having a lot more fire in fire regime group four than we used to used to have, and we probably need to understand that a little bit better because four and five are the fires which, in many cases, are the most difficult to suppress, uh, lead to sort of the the kind of the headline grabbing 
um, um, you know, results that we see in terms of effects on homes and community. And in some cases, particularly when we're talking about some of our rangeland system or sagebrush habitats where we would like to, to see less fire than we have, you know, these are very important to us and what's going on there. So we, you know, why, I won't go into all the details here, but, you know, this information tells us that we've got a fundamental fuels problem and it begins to, say, to suggest to some of the places where we ought to be focusing our attention. Um, so we develop a, in combination with, with other folks and, pull, again, pulling from the regional, a variety of different options. Um, looking at prescribed fire, where it's used now, where we might expand it, where we might, might have problems sort of putting it in play, uh, thinking about managing wildfires for reforest objectives in both forested and non-forested systems, places, again, where that's going to have a potential conflict with kind of community concerns, uh, looking at the various kind of non-fire uh, fuel treatments that occur, um, and so forth. And so each one of these sort of options that we've developed, there's a logic behind, you know, how we would map that on the landscape using the information we have. And so each one generates a particular kind of map. Um, and again, I'm not going to describe each map or get into it, but you can see, for example, that in prescribed fire, that a lot of the southeast lands in that category under option A, where we use prescribed fire to manage fuels because we're already using it there. And we have the sort of the expertise, the community acceptance of the uh, ecosystems and so forth. And so we would we would encourage, you know, continued use and perhaps expansion of that. There are some other counties where we would might even think about expanding the use. It's all, you know, subject to for local constraints and consideration. And there's some places where you might consider it, but we sort of caution that there's gonna be some issues there that may make its use less desirable. Um, we have similar discussions and, and uh, processes we've gone through looking at the other sort of national challenges. I won't, won't go into those. Um, every one of them generates their own specific map. We've got these, these maps that, that are available for folks to look at and to think about and to sort of use in different ways, and we'll do that in a, again in upcoming workshops. When we get to, to the, okay, so what? Um, you know, how do you use all these different maps or you just stack them all up and now you've got a national strategy? Well, we, we wanted to, to also sort of motivate the discussion and national priorities, thinking about where we are, where we're going in terms of risk over time. Um, I'll just sort of leave it that, that without a lot of discussion that my own sort of hypothesis, if we assume that this is where we are now, my own sort of read of the information and the trend lines there are, is that we're on this, this, this curve A, where we're going to see continually increasing risk through time if we don't begin to do some things very differently. Well, what is it, how is it that we could change that curve? Well, one, one option we could do is we could spend a whole lot more time in sort of bringing fires back to historical levels across the landscape. That might lead to a curve that looks something like B, where there's a Pretty, pretty substantial increase in the short-term risk associated with that because we're going to be putting fire in places that it doesn't currently burn. We're going to have some effects of that. Uh, but through time, it should get us to a place that's lower than we would otherwise be. And then I think there's a sort of the ideal kind of curve that we would like to see, which looks more like C, which is that we can head off some of those increases in long-term risk by taking some greater risk in the short term. In fact, we've, we've sort of make the argument that, that there are some assumptions to, the, to, the, to developing a national strategy. One is that we're going to have to do some prioritization of the investments that we have, become, more, become better at sort of putting our, our dollars and resources in the places that will have the greatest effect. We're going to have to accept some increase in short-term risk. Um, given that, you know, resources are limited and some of the things we're going to need to do to kind of change these systems away, carry inherent risk, and overall we're going to have to have greater collective investment. And I don't necessarily mean just federal investment, but sort of at all levels, some, some investment in both resources and time and personnel. We, we went through a process, we'll give you a little bit more details about that in sort of the next presentation of, of coming up to using our option maps, using our, our classes, using our community clusters and that. We've come up with some spatial prioritization maps where we said, you know, for fuels management, there are some places across the landscape where we would prioritize. 
Uh, we're not telling you what to do in those particular counties or that or even how to do it, but what we're saying is that from a national perspective, these are the places where the fuels management uh, options seem to be most applicable. When you get to community action, there's a lot of the country that could use some additional focus on that, um, sort of a high and high, moderate and low priorities there. Some of the, the lowest priorities, not, that, not to say that we need, don't need to do something about protecting communities, but what we're really saying there is that it, a lot of those landscapes lend themselves to individual action rather than sort of coordinated community action. Uh, we got similar similar maps for for prevention and trying to reduce the the incidence of human caused ignitions. And then when we're talking about response, we've got some uh, some thought process or some thoughts about how to to think about particularly large responding to large fires, beginning to use wildland fire use more uh, extensively and effectively. Places where you you probably ha you have the option to do that places where you probably don't um, thinking about you know how to, how you would sort of sort of shape your response and all of that is described in, in greater detail in both the report and, in, and upcoming reports and it's embedded in the data and information we're going to talk about all right so I've used more of my time than than was originally allotted um, and um, and so I'm going to defer for some of the other information to, to Jim's presentation, but let me just, can we unmute or see if quickly if mm -hmm. folks have any. All participants are now in interactive talk mode. Okay. Um, any, any questions for me? Great. I think you hit the right button there, Darren. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so as um, as we're changing presentations, this is Jim. Uh, just remind you, if you do have questions uh, in the WebEx, if you just want to list them on chat so we can capture those, we are going to try to have a little bit more of a, a conversation at the end of my presentation for that as well, too. Um, I'm going to let Karen now put us back on broadcast mode unless I hear any voices right now. Good, so we're going to go back to broadcast mode. All participants are now in listen-only mode. So what we are seeing is Danny gave a uh, um, large strategic overview, and what I'm going to try to do is take that strategic overview and break it into the foundational building blocks to give you a little bit better idea of what's going on behind the scenes. Um, really one of the key points that Danny was making though that we've done this analysis to really be leading to action. And so we're at the phase, and, and Mike mentioned this in the introduction too, that we're starting to roll out the national report and it's only going to be effective if we can actually implement and so starting with these workshops, we want to be getting the right tools in people's hands to allow the implementation of the national strategy to work. And so what I just want to start with is the same conceptual model that Danny showed and really be making the point that this is a complete system at work, that when you start looking at all of these building blocks, that we really can't be looking at any one of the pieces by themselves. That you really need to look at how this whole system is working to be able to really come up with some effective solutions. Uh, for example, examining a fuel treatment's impact on not only the landscape but also the nearby communities is critical for examining the net change, which you can see at the bottom of this conceptual model, and ensure we're making progress when measured by all three goals of the national strategy. So to get to the point of the components of the analysis, we've really broken this up into five pieces. I'm going to start with some of the input variables, uh, quickly review what Danny was talking about with the national characterization, uh, look at these challenges and opportunities that are the options that Danny was introducing, uh, going over again the national strategy, which are the priorities. And really, I think what you're probably going to be most interested today, and that's why we're saving it to the last, just so that you uh, uh, will stay with us, is you know how can these products 
uh, be used for application and communication. And we're going to show you four specific examples for the southeast on this as well, too. So let's start with the input variables. As Danny said that, you know, we're really looking at county level data. And, you know, we have to get all the data on a comparable scale. And the primary reason is driven by the level of key decisions. We know that as we start looking at a lot of these issues, that a lot of the issues can only be kind of examined on that scale. But also when we're starting to look at solutions, we also know that uh, the majority of um, on the ground decisions and actions in our country happen on a county level scale as well too. So we want to make sure that the data for the analysis is actually matching the uh, scale of the decision as well too. Okay, well I know how much all of us love spreadsheets and just wanted to show you, you know, from where we start. Um, this is a spreadsheet and Danny mentioned that, you know, these data sets are looking at things as diverse as environmental, socioeconomic, some of the fire-related data. And, you know, there are over 300 different data sets. Um, I think Danny did show that there's over 3,000 counties as well, too. And when we start looking at how we actually put these together, a lot of this data then comes into um, a, a scale that we can actually look at this way. Uh, as we start working with some of the workshops, we will provide access to this level of data for people to be interacting with so you can really kind of understand what's going on. But if you want to just start exploring the data spatially, that there are some data sets that naturally lend themselves to just going ahead and, and uh, pulling straight from the spreadsheet and be able to display those uh, spatially uh, using techniques, uh, GIS, uh, other things to create these maps. And you can see these are two sample data sets where you look at area forested on the left, federal ownership on the right. Those are um, pretty easy to start kind of taking a look at and saying, oh, well, here's the distribution. And you can see, you know, especially for the southeast, the people on the call, you know, that uh, the southeast is, you know, very heavily forested. And you can see that by the dark uh, across the southeast. Uh, however, if you look at the other data set, you can see that there's not nearly as much federal ownership in the southeast as, say, there is in the west. So even by just pulling up these different data sets and becoming familiar with them, you can instantly start seeing what some of these trends are like. However, this is another map uh, that Danny showed in his presentation. And um, I don't really want to talk about what the map is showing, but the type of map. And you can see that this is a map that is uh, very much like you would see an artist painting a map and is a nice continuous and you can see a lot of the different uh, points of color. Well, those points of color are what we in the, uh, the mapping community call a raster map. And a raster map has the samplings for all these different little pixels all the way across. Well, to get this onto a comparable scale so that we can then look at how this information does compare to other data sets, we then convert that raster data and compile it really onto a county summary. So the same map that you were seeing in the previous slide can be summarized on a county level scale and saying, okay, what is the dominant fire regime group in each of these counties? And you can see then the, uh, the pattern that starts emerging sitting through here. And Danny gave a really good example for Fire Regime Group 5, which is showing up in the blue on this map. And as Danny said, you know, there is a large uh, swath of this that fits into the northeast, but the majority of the other counties are in the west that you're seeing in blue. I do want to point out, though, that there are some counties, especially in Florida and a couple in Louisiana, in Fire Regime Group 5 that are found in the southeast as well, too. And so, uh, again, the scale of this map maybe will not allow you to discern that. But those are the things that we can start interrogating and understanding from these data sets. But again, we've had to convert a lot of the data sets from a raster uh, reality to these county summaries. There are some other things that Danny talked about, and that's some of these dimensional reduction techniques. 
there are so many different variables that no matter how smart or intuitive any of us are, that it is just not, we're not able as human beings to take 300 different variables and just by visual inspection start to really say, oh, here's a key trend that I can understand from one of these maps to the 299 other ones. However, there are um, a lot of these that we can start using dimensional reduction techniques that we can start saying, okay, I can combine some of these, look at ways that they fit together, and then I can actually de be uh, developing some new data sets that are summaries of those or good representations so that we as humans can intuitively say, oh, I'm understanding that, I can see how these apply. And so these dimensional reduction techniques that are used are some that Danny's already mentioned. He's showed you uh, like a classification tree. He showed you some clustering. The one that I just want to show you the other example, and those of you that have seen some of Danny's presentations, you know, recognize this slide from that. This is a factor analysis and a way to produce some continuous variables. And you can see just the way that these data points line up by comparing variable X against variable Y that you can look at one major axis of the data, say along this F1 line, would be a good way to be giving an approximation of that data. But you can also see that some of these continuous variables can be looked at in a different view as well, too. And so just look at the F2 line to be uh, seeing that. Again, not going to go into a lot of detail in this, but when we start doing the workshops, we can show how those work and talk about how the statistics work on those as well, too. The key thing to understand is when you start looking at these building blocks, we develop now a new county level data set. And this county level data set, which you're going to see, and Danny mentioned is one of the key building blocks for the community clusters, is something called the demographic stress factor score. And you can see, and, and Danny talked about, you know, as we started putting these together, that there are a variety of data inputs that would go into this sort of factor score. And so looking at the demographic stress for counties nationwide, you'd be considering things uh, as, as far as like total population, how much population growth has there been. Um, you know, uh, people go to counties usually where there's jobs and leave counties where there's not. This is a lot of the rural exodus, you know, that is so prevalent in our nation now of people leaving rural counties to go to the more urban counties for jobs. You can also see poverty rates uh, and, you know, household income, educational attainment. But when you put those together, you can actually see then these darker counties on this map are counties that have a higher demographic stress when compared to the other counties nationwide. Okay, well, once we have the data sets put together on a comparable scale on this county scale, we can actually start exploring the data relationships. And one way we do that is using a Bayesian network. And uh, the Bayesian network are these boxes that are shown in the, uh, the light beige on the right-hand side of the screen. But to understand what's going on, Danny's talked about conceptual models um, I think most of us understand a little bit of a mental model, and that's shown in the left, that when you look at, say, three main uh, types of things going on, and let's just take this example of climate fuels and wildfire, that if you start saying, okay, I know there is a relationship between these, but, you know, what is, what's going on? Well, we start using these arrows, and you can see the blue arrows that start connecting these three main topics. And what the arrows are really looking at are showing this relationship, and it's not just a link, uh, it's why it's an arrow instead of just a bar. It is showing an impact or a cause and effect. And so again, for the simple example of, you know, climate is having an impact on fuels, Climate also has its impact on wildfire, but fuels also has its impact on wildfire. And so you start looking at where these arrows are leading to. Well, the Bayesian network that is on the right-hand side of the screen, again, is a, just a simple three-node network. 
And you can see then that we're relating regions to annual ignitions and normalized area burned. A lot of people say, well, what exactly am I looking at here? Well, you can see the numbers, and especially look at this first one here around region, that you can see the numbers that are after each of these. But if you add each of these up, these are always going to add up to 100%. And then if you start looking at what these colored bars are, this is just the uh, distribution that you're looking at across through here. And so that if you would turn this on its side, you know, this is a little bit of a, a kind of a bell-shaped curve. You can see that this has this sort of relationship. This is a little bit more evenly distributed sitting through here. But really what these are showing you are how the breakouts occur, remembering that these all add up to 100%. And then the colored bars are showing you, you know, the size of those percentages as well, too. And when you start looking at even more complex ones, um, then you can see that the, the same pattern is actually occurring sitting through here as well, too. So this is a larger Bayesian network. And those of you that have participated in some of the workshops we've held with the regions or other places will probably recognize this one. This is uh, one that was created for vegetation, fuels, and fire. And you can see instead of just three factors that we've got such things as ignitions, burn probability, compared to some terrain and some uh, climate factors, and then comparing that to vegetation and surface fuels. Well, again, um, these Bayesian networks can be very large or they can be smaller. But by linking these to these 300 data sets, because this is the key thing to realize, that each one of these links to one of those 300 county level data sets that are represented in that spreadsheet, that we can construct small or larger um, Bayesian networks to be exploring the data and be understanding this cause and effect. And this is then where the conceptual models and working with the experts over the years. It's why we held so many different workshops with the Southeast, uh, with technical experts, to really understand how these arrows connect and why those things are important. And so through the time that we've been working with the uh, regional strategy committees, we've really been able to understand how those things work, and specifically for the Southeast, or on a regional scale as well as a national. Well, there's another way to compare this data, and that's through another uh, tool called a pivot table. You uh, can also look at these relationships and really just do this in Microsoft Excel as well, too. But you can see for this example that we're showing here that if you look at a map of the Southeast, and look at these non-fire fuel treatments that are looking sitting through here, we can also, through a variety of uh, pivot table relationships, start pulling out, well, who are the, uh, you know, where is the conservation land across the different states in the southeast? And if you start looking at the players for each of these three different options, the three different colors here of the green, blue, and red, that you can see that, for instance, the green here is a lot more of the state being dominant, where for the blue, it's not only the state, but the Department of Defense being big players. You can see if I wanted to say, well, where is the U.S. Forest Service going to be a major player, we'd see that the U.S. Forest Service you know, is here on both A and C, but very little on B. So it's ways to really explore the relationships uh, using this very large number of data sets, but for us to really kind of understand those. That's really what a lot of the workshops are going to be, these two sets of workshops, is showing you how to be able to work with these data sets, use tools like the Bayesian networks and the pivot tables to explore those relationships and understand how all that works. Okay, so we're finished now talking about some of the, uh, the variables. Let's quickly review what Danny was talking about, about the national characterization. So Danny talked about then, um, uh, again, moving from just each individual data set, but how could we actually look at classifying or characterizing the nation using some of these tools? 
And Danny introduced the topic of saying, okay, if we actually look at the nation from a landscape perspective and looking at classifying it, went through this tool of this classification tree. And it looks at these county level attributes again as well too. And you can see that the map is being displayed on a county level scale. It is coloring in individual counties. It is not producing a raster map, which is more that look of a painted map. So uh, again, quickly reviewing the landscape classes use some of these major data sets. So as Danny talked about, you know, urban value, that is one of these county level data sets. Every time you look at one of these diamonds, that is another one of these county level data sets. And we are classifying then the nation by looking at the distribution within these. Again, Danny pointed out, say on forested area, if forested area is less than 10% of that county, it goes over onto this branch of the tree. And so you would be able to see that areas across the nation that have less than 10% of the county that are forested are going to be defined then by these three classes of D, E, and F. However, in the southeast, remember the map that we saw just a little bit ago since many of the counties across the southeast, with the exception of Texas, a lot of West Texas, uh, but the, a lot of those counties have greater than 10% of that county which are forested, which are going to be putting you then into this part of the classification tree. And once we understand that those counties are forested, we can start separating out, okay, well, you know, how much of that county has, has burned recently, and if it's greater than 1%, you get into these J and Ks, if not, then you get into the G, H's, and I's. You'll see that across the southeast that G, H, I, and K are going to be some of your large classes then that we're going to start looking at for the southeast. And again, you can see that in this map as it comes through here, that you can see that the colors of G, H, I, and K, especially the greens and then this reddish brown, are really some of the dominance. But also, we do know that we as humans are dominant in the southeastern landscape. So you remember what Danny said off of this classification tree, that you remember the first question we asked is the urban value of A sitting through here, that that is the other real big thing that really shows up across the southeast. You know, you can see these urban corridors of Atlanta connecting into Greenville and Charlotte up into Raleigh uh, up into Richmond sitting through here. We can see Dallas-Fort Worth, Houston, uh, obviously the large urban uh, nature of the coastal counties of Florida. So we can see those to helping define the landscape too. And so we can really look at this map to heart, help start imagining what that landscape is and then being able to compare it uh, and looking at this tool, uh, again, this consumer reports for saying, okay, if I wanted to be looking nationally at which of these classes has the highest average urban value, well, of course it makes sense. Again, A would have that in that dark green color. However, if we wanted to see which counties have a very high amount of federal ownership, we can see going down this column that there's actually three dark green filled in circles sitting through here. And so we would be looking at classes C, G, and J they would have some high federal ownership. Now, if you wanted to look at using this tool the other way, and especially looking at this class H, which are these eastern forests with ongoing prescribed fire, you can see that there are several things that really you know, light up as dark green sitting through there. A very high percent area forested, an index of prescribed fire activity, and this is a natural and mixed landscape. Not only that, but you can see the number of counties, you know, there's 459 counties, um, you know, about a seventh of the counties, uh, or maybe about an eighth of the counties nationwide actually fit into that classification. So it's, a, it's one of our larger classes. If you want to just look at how that fits with the map, we've just pulled out, say, uh, class D. It's more the agriculture and grasslands. Um, and you can see that those are shown up in this brown area sitting through here. 
this is very low forested area coming into parts of Oklahoma and Texas for the southeast, and that's why you would be looking at those. Well, let's then look at the other way, and this is the community clusters that Danny was talking about. And you can see that as far as being able to develop this map, instead of using a classification tree, we have used a means of clustering, and you can see that that clustering is being displayed using a belief net here again as well, too. And this is a little fuzzy on this screen, but this is region and states. These are the community clusters, one through eight. And remember, Danny talked about then these are the six factor scores, which include these concepts of demographic advantage, demographic stress, this uh, maximum ignition density, uh, maximum area burned, and then these are two WUI Wu measurements, Wildland Urban Interface, WUI, WUI, Wildland Urban Interface scores that are sitting through here. So if we wanted to look at those, you can see that this clustering technique is again a way to be able to divide the country out into these eight clusters, but it's a different statistical uh, technique than a classification tree. Uh, in the workshops that we're going to be running, we'll go over this in a little bit more detail as well, too. But really what is happening is you're taking these variables. And again, remember Danny said that these are these six factor scores, and there were actually 17 of the data sets on a county level scale that were combined using factor scores to generate these six. And then we've used these six to be able to create this map, which gives us the eight community clusters. And again, when we start looking at the distribution across through here, you can again see that there are some dominant colors that are starting to define the southeast as far as the type of communities that we're seeing here as well, too. Uh, once again, this is the tool that we can start looking at to be reviewing clusters uh, against these type of factor scores. And again, we can see that uh, across uh, you know, the nation that cluster four has you know, a large number of colors or things lighting up going on with it and would you know, define something like that as well, too. Danny then um, introduced the topic of combinations. So we have now looked at being able to start characterizing um, our nation, and we looked at landscape classes, community clusters, and now the combinations of those. So we can see these 11 landscape classes down the left side of this compared to the eight community clusters across the horizontal axis, and then the intersection. Well, obviously, we can see that the 3,109 counties add up from either adding them up from a community viewpoint or this landscape classes. But also, if you would add up all of these numbers in the middle of this table, you're also going to add up to 3,109. And so what we can start seeing then is even by looking at these simple breakouts of classes and, and clusters, that we really have to compare them by these combinations to shed light on the most difficult issues. This is a tool that's being provided, and you can see that we have these summaries that we're providing specifically for the Southeast that looks at how the Southeast and these classes work. And as Danny said, we have created these summary sheets for each of the combinations. And so if you look, you can actually see that combination 3H is uh, the most common across the southeast, and therefore we would go into this tool set and actually look at this 3H information sheet. Well, let's quickly move on then from ways that we characterize a nation to the things that we start looking at options. Remember, as I started out, I was again reiterating the point that the reason we did the analysis is to be able to look at the total system working together but what we want to be doing is looking at that system to go to, towards solutions. And the solutions are these actions. These actions are you know, these, the variety of options that are being covered in this table. 
And you can see that Danny started talking about these that are vegetation and fuels compared to the other ones. But what you see as we're going to go through each of these option maps very quickly, that there's not a one-size-fit-all solution uh, for reducing overall risk, but that you know each of us individually on the ground are really going to be wanting to start look at our individual county and starting to say, well, what are those options? What are some of the best things that I can be doing locally you know, based on this national analysis. This is the same map that Danny was showing. This is the prescribed fire map. And this looks at, um, you know, where prescribed fire, you know, would be best um, utilized across the nation. And again, you can see that there are three different colors that we are looking at option A, and that's the one that covers most of the southeast is using prescribed fire to manage fuels where it's already being used. Uh, the red color is, uh, you know, consider expanding the use of ex uh, uh, prescribed fire. There's even some counties in the southeast where it looks like prescribed fire would be a very useful tool, but it's just not being utilized at the current time. You can see that color becomes much more dominant across Texas and then across a lot of the west as well, too. Well, when we start looking at that, you might say, well, how is this option map constructed? Well, again, we look at these county level data sets. And for this option 1A, we look at known areas of prescribed fire activity. This is an index of the area burned using prescribed fire in this map. And then we can start looking at the potential for fire, prescribed fire, in both a forested landscape and non-forested landscape. And when we start looking then at combining those using this formula sitting through here, we can actually arrive at that first option, which is again this green area uh, on the map. Now, within the report and on the website that we are creating for Cohesive Fire, it goes into details for each of these calculations as well too and we can go into that in the workshops as well. I just want to quickly step through the rest of the options just so that you can see those maps and we can discuss a little bit uh, about what each of those are. This is again under vegetation and fuels, but this is really for managing wildfire for resource benefits. And again, you can see that this is not uh, nearly showing that option across the southeast, but there are quite a few counties across the southeast that are showing up under C, uh, but just understanding that wildfire is going to have conflicts with communities in that uh, option sitting through there compared to options A and B, which are looking at forested and non-forested landscapes, and especially across the west and some parts of west Texas where we can really be looking at this option and it's not having as much of a trade-off sort of uh, sort of questions with uh, populous places or large you know, number of people living in communities. If you look at non-fire fuel treatments, uh, again, there are three set of options through here. But again, this is still under the large topic of vegetation and fuels. Uh, and uh, the final one sitting in through vegetation and fuels is fuel treatments as a precursor to managed fire. And you can see that this is one that we can discuss you know, quite a bit across the southeast as well, too. If we start looking then at the next large category of these options, these are homes, communities, and values at risk. These are home defensive actions. These are areas where we start looking at the number of buildings involved and structures lost. There are a lot of counties across the southeast that are showing up in this highest category. And so if we start looking at, you know, where we can actually start being a lot more proactive of trying to protect some of those communities uh, through some home defensive action, maybe some education, some uh, funded activities to really get homeowners to be proactive. If we start looking at another option of home and community actions, this is looking at not only a homeowner protecting their home, but also the community working together. Um, this map is displaying not only the communities that light up, but the background uh, more raster data set that you're seeing is that uh, average urban value. So again, you can see these uh, urban corridors showing up you know, quite a bit sitting through here. 
But again, we can see that there's not as many counties in the southeast, except again for West Texas and Oklahoma sitting through here, that this is one of those options that would be discussed and, and really seriously considered. Um, another thing, you know, really looking at building codes being used as an option, especially for new construction. We know that, you know, uh, population growth is going to continue uh, across the southeast. Are there ways that we can actually put new construction codes together to really help uh, making, you know, the, the homes and businesses a lot more fire resistant just from a construction? We finally move into the last set of options, which, uh, well, uh, another major set of options, which are human-caused ignitions. This is comparing accidental ignitions, which are um, things that are like, you know, uh, brush fires, uh, trash burning, getting away from you, compared to the other set of uh, ignitions, which are intentional, a little bit more arson-related. And these are sets of options where we look at how that fits across here as well, too. And then finally, the effective and efficient wildfire response, which are preparing for these large, long-duration wildfires. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this. It's not saying that you know, response is not important all the way across the nation, but it's really trying to look at uh, examining some data on some of these large, long-duration fires and where those are occurring. And uh, look at this as kind of a heat map, that the hotter the color, the reds and oranges, you know, the higher this is on the relative risk sitting through here. Again, those of us that know, you know, the southeast are not surprised of seeing a lot of Florida and some of the coastal Carolinas lighting up, as well as large parts of Oklahoma and Texas as well, too. And finally, when we start looking at protecting structures and treating landscape fuels, where that's going to be most effective as well, too, and then looking at targeting some of these ignitions uh, from an accidental as well as some uh, intentional. Well, just quickly finish on the options. I do want to remind us that um, this whole national cohesive strategy is really about using the combination of these tools together to be looking at the whole system and at looking how these solutions actually apply. And so, again, it's important to be able to look at any of these option maps and see how they fit with these community clusters and landscape classes to understand the type of options and the type of programs that could then be applied. Because if you're going to be implementing this, say, across this swath of the southeast, you want to know where similar communities and landscapes are occurring as well, too. So you'd want to be using all of those tools that we've talked about to the, up to this point. Danny also talked about these priorities. This is the next major section. And it's really like, okay, now that we've got these options, you know, where do you start? Uh, what are some of these things that are the most important? And this is another look at these combinations but if you look at the combinations and you start looking at across which part of these combinations would have the most importance for doing some of these priorities, we can see that we've been able to use this tool of the combination uh, table to actually be able to construct some of these priority maps. And this is uh, the first priority map which looks at this vegetation and fuels and where this is really becoming uh, a really priority uh, for nationwide for looking at um, prioritization of various broad-scale fuels management. Um, again, um, across the southeast, you can see this uh, large crescent uh, that's really showing up, you know, as well as some other areas and trends that are occurring sitting through here. This is looking at, you know, where we really are going to have this largest impact. And again, you remember in Danny's presentation where he showed those three curves at the end about if we can actually start getting ahead of the situation and getting to more of this, this uh, better uh, way that we can actually manage the, the fuel situation, this is going to get us back on maybe the right curve and, and how some of the fire regimes work. We have three other priority maps. And they focus on uh, some of these big issues that Danny was talking about. This looks more at the homes, communities, and values that when you start looking at 
oops, and this actually has some wrong words on this slide. I apologize for that. This is a different map. Uh, it's just a little bit of a typo that we didn't catch sitting through here. But again, uh, this is looking at uh, communities that, uh, you know, we're going to be really focusing on a lot of those communities and wildland urban interfaces where investments can really make a difference. Um, managing human-caused ignitions. Um, what we can again see sitting through here that um, whether we like it or not across the southeast, uh, a lot of the ignitions that we are seeing are human caused, that if we start looking at programs that are either education or enforcement, we can actually see where those can be best employed by looking at these national priorities. And from an effective and efficient wildfire response, Again, uh, it's not to discount or say that local response issues are unimportant. Indeed, all these wildfires begin at a local, as local response events. But if you started looking at you know, areas which have uh, some combined uh, things going on, you know, what are some of those counties as well, too? It's, again, not the intent of this webinar to go into any of these products in detail, but to show you how they're all fitting together. Well, we've said all that to now get to this point. You know, what are you going to be interested in? And what we really want to be talking about is how can these products be used, you know, by the Southeast region to really answer some specific questions. So we want to quickly go through four examples for you to say, okay, now that you've seen all those pieces, how can we actually use this information to be really moving into this solution and implementation part of the phase. You know, how do I understand what the National Science Analysis team has done? How can I use these tools to really be looking at doing this application on the ground? So the first uh, example that I want to show is using these data variables and these networks to explore some relationships. We're then going to be looking at some options and how do we explore those by maybe some of the major players here. If we wanted to look at the combinations, you know, which are the main ones we might want to look at in the southeast? You know, how do they fit with some of our national priorities? And finally, if you start looking at these options that are most prevalent in the southeast, you know, what about the data variables that characterize our region and how can we compare it to other regions? Well, Mike started today's uh, presentation by showing uh, this figure. Uh, this was some of the early work that uh, the science team was able to do interacting with the southeast uh, region and looking at this Bayesian network, which looks at home, um, vegetation, some fuels, uh, and the home sitting through here and seeing how these factors work together. And so the southeast wanted to know, okay, what are these mechanical treatment areas, you know, for the forest? What are these areas that have been, had the highest area burned index? And then if we look at this WUI area factor score, that if we just started comparing those and started selecting high values in each of those three nodes, and you remember these gray boxes or any of these boxes in the network each of these apply to county level data sets. So you can see the WUI area factor box here compares to this WUI area factor map here. This area burned index fits with this, and this mechanical treatment box fits with this. And what was done then was the Southeast wanted to select these areas that have the highest value for mechanical treatment, have the highest area burned index, and the highest WUI area index. And so in other words, again, the darker areas here, the more red areas here, the more red areas here. And if you selected those states and these three nodes, what would those counties look like? Why would it, you know, how would we see this distribution across the southeast? And you can see then by, again, the brighter colors sitting through here, that the counties that have the brightest level orange, you know, have the greatest amount of um, you know, relationship between those things happening sitting through here. So we can do that by using these 300 different data variables and the networks that are assigned. We can just do this exploration and seeing how these relationships fit 
and understand what is going on. Now, we can also then look at using networks in these data sets to explore options by looking at major agencies or groups. And so if we wanted to ask this question, how much U.S. Forest Service land or alternately how much Department of Defense land you know, would prescribed fire you know, use be applicable for? You can see that in this network that this has been constructed for having uh, the U.S. Forest Service uh, ownership land sitting through here. And so this was actually populated using just counties that have a percent of U.S. Forest Service land within them. And then we are able to explore then how that fits with some of these key factors as well as some of the options that are sitting through here. And what happens then is you can start looking at putting out some summaries sitting through here. And uh, Matt Hutchins, who is part of the NEMAC team here, is in the room too. And Matt, do you want to quickly tell them what they're saying here in these two, two graphs? Um, so the map at the top just looks at the prescribed fire use option of the three, A, B, and C. A is looking at um, areas of using prescribed fire where it's already being used. B is considering expanding use of prescribed fire where it's currently um, underutilized and then C prescribed fire but on a limited basis. And so the graph, two graphs at the bottom look at the agency groups on the left, the U.S. Forest Service and the Department of Defense and Department of Energy lands on the right side. And so those two graphs look at the amount of land within those three options for prescribed fire use. And so the graphs are showing amount of acres um, of land ownership within those. Right, so what this example is showing is we go into the workshops with the Southeast is how could you ask similar questions for any agency or group or even private landowners looking at any one of these options sitting through there. So it's very easy to take the data and explore and look at how these options apply as far as, as players go. And you can again see that, you know, if you're trying to coordinate um, you know, the amount of resources that you have across the Southeast, say for either the Forest Service or Department of Defense, so you can start getting an idea about, okay, well, what are some of the, you know, uh, the amount of acres and all that I'm going to be looking at that are really covered by each of these options. Well, the third example is, you know, which combinations are most prevalent in the Southeast and how do they relate, you know, to our priorities and options. Well, this is straight from one of these, again, uh, Bayesian networks. But this is just looking at the combinations uh, across the southeast. And you can see that when we start looking at these combinations, and you remember the combinations are looking at um, a number, which is coming from the community clusters, and a letter, which is coming from the landscape class. And you can see that the largest amount of acreage across the southeast is in this combination 3H. And so if you, again, wanted to explore what 3H is all about, you could go into this combination page and say, okay, I'm seeing that's going on. And if you wanted to start looking at then, you know, the uh, combinations that cover the most acreage across the southeast, we could look at that, you know, purely from uh, uh, an aerial type of distribution. However, there is another way to look at that, and these are these um, sets of consumer reports, and you can see now that these have been customized to just the region. So instead of looking nationwide, we can use similar uh, consumer reports to be looking at what specifically is happening in the southeast. And we know from the classification tree that we went over that there are no classes B or J, just by the way the classification tree worked, in the southeast. And in fact, when you look at the distribution of counties, there are two other uh, classes, which are C and F, which only have four counties each in those. You can again see that you know H is the, the most dominant sitting through here. And so if you look at the statistics, classes H, I, and K cover 67%. Classes A and E cover another 24%, so that adds up to 91% of the Southeast fit into just these five classes. 
However, Class G does have 49 counties in it, and you can see the large number of green dots that are sitting through here. We know that these are public forest lands with high fire potential, that even though that they are not one, this is not one of the largest classes, it is probably one of the classes where a, quite a bit of action or implementation solutions are really going to have to be addressed. So again, just looking at percentages is not the only way to look at this. It's actually looking at where key actions need to happen. The same thing with community clusters. If you look at just five of the clusters, that's going to be covering 87%. But again, looking at you know, uh, cluster four, uh, which we've labeled suburbs on the edge, 34 counties across the southeast you know, have a large amount of things going on with it and really deserves a look and a discussion. Well, the fourth example, and uh, some of you that have been working really with this through the time, recognize this. Uh, we put this out for a workshop almost a year ago about what makes the Southeast unique. And this view of what makes the Southeast unique is looking at a lot of these individual data sets. And if you look at the southeast of how it compares to the rest of the nation, you can see that going around this, that you know the southeast is more urban than the rest of the nation is. There's a higher ignition density sitting through here, much more demographic stress. However, there's less federal ownership. Uh, there's more forested area um, and somewhat heavily eroded. And if you start looking at these down here, these are some you know talking about the uh, potential for prescribed fire as well, too. Well, that's one way to look at what makes the Southeast unique from a data perspective and the individual data sets. But again, I just wanted to zoom into the Southeast and look at the four national priority maps. You can actually see that the Southeast, you know, has a large number of counties that really light up on all four national priority maps as well, too. So we know that the Southeast has a, uh, a variety of challenges ahead of it and a lot of opportunities for action, but again, having to balance the amount of resources for examining those as well, too. So that's going to be another thing that's going to have to be you know, looked at and discussed within the Southeast. And with that, I'm done talking, and we will uh, turn it over to Karen. Okay. Why don't we, uh, before Karen is, why don't we open it up for some quick questions as well, too. So let's open it up. All participants are now in interactive talk mode. So can we uh, answer a few questions before Karen gives the, the last presentation of the webinar? I guess my question would be, um, whether you're going to send out a, a set of the slides from the presentation. Yes, yes, we are. And what we're going to do is we are going to send out a set of the slides. And if we've got notes on the slides as well, too, uh, we'll include those as uh, a PDF uh, generated with the notes on the bottom of the slide as well. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah, I've got a question. Why is it just uh, federally owned uh, lands and, and not just not all public lands considered? Um, all public lands are considered. Um, you can actually see in the example that one of the large categories on one of the slides actually showed state lands as you know being one of the major players. There's another classification which looks at like uh, conservation uh, partners like uh, the Nature Conservancy and, and others. Um, so each of those are considered. And uh, I'm sorry if I gave the wrong impression just from the example where we just focused on two federal partners. We can do the same thing for the state partners or the, uh, um, the other major players here as well, too. OK, thanks. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Okay, well, this is Dave Frederick. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. Um, just want to make a comment. Uh, we've looked at uh, just a few of the data layers. You mentioned that there's over 300 data layers. So 
um, the same kind of analysis can be done for a lot of other uh, forestry-related activities, uh, forest management, and, and um, you know, see where timber harvesting has been done, and a lot, a lot of other applications other than just fire. You're you're exactly right, and and what this these workshops will do is allow the participants to bring those data sets and we can look at how they integrate in to be answering some specific implementation. Um, you know, especially probably across the southeast, it's very possible that you've got some rich data sets that, you know, cover all the counties across the southeast that just weren't available for maybe the northeast or west and so couldn't go into the national analysis, you know, but might be very worthwhile for looking at some specific issues, you know, for the southeast. Okay, so let's let Karen go over kind of the work, what's next, what to expect from these next set of workshops. All right, one second. All participants are now in listen-only mode. Okay, um, I'm going to take a few minutes now just to cover what we'll be um, reviewing in the workshops that both Jim and Danny alluded to. Uh, we're going to have two sets of workshops. The first series is workshop one. Um, we have some general expectations of what will happen during these workshops. Uh, we intend to provide you know, a background on basically how the science analysis is developed and a basic introduction to the tools and models that we've talked about today. Uh, there are going to be, uh, like I said, uh, there will be two half-day sessions. So there will be two separate half-day sessions. Uh, it will be one overnight stay. Uh, we're expected for these uh, this first workshop uh, attendees. You know there'll be interactive uh, exercises, so we're expecting attendees to uh, bring a laptop and they'll be able to actually interact and use some of the software, which is actually it's just called Netica, um, to uh, interact with the belief networks. Some of the belief networks we've shown today. Uh, we'll send out instructions before the workshops uh, to. Uh, have every attendee who's interested to actually download the software. It's pretty simple. Um, but we'll also have time during the workshop to actually do that if there was any difficulties prior to that. Um, we're limiting it with a cap of about 35 people per session. Um, those who are interested in attending uh, this first workshop uh, are, are folks who are wanting basically a better understanding of the science analysis and how the data information could be used uh, for the southeast. Um, I'll just quickly go over what we expect to go for with the agenda for this first workshop. Again, it's going to be a review of the tools that we should introduce to you today uh, from you know, the county level uh, data and the maps that were generated, the belief networks and the pivot tables that can be used to um, explore some of that data, and then diving into the uh, landscape classes and community clusters as well as um, the combinations and the options and the priorities that were all outlined just previously by Jim and Danny. Um, we're going to spend a little time actually introducing you to the, the website where all of this information is going to be hosted. Um, there will be a, a section on the website here for where you actually can download some of the data and we'll, we'll walk you through how to interact with the site and access a lot of all the information. Um, and then we're gonna, going to spend um, some time uh, looking at the southeast region and really what some of the products that, that Jim touched on here uh, and see how those products and data can, uh, what it can tell us about the southeast region, determining you know, what makes the southeast unique within this data and how it's characterized, um, and then review you know, the, some of the combinations uh, that uh, Jim touched on and you know, what, what some of those top five to ten combinations are in the southeast and really what, is it, what does it mean. Um, we'll be using pre-made examples essentially. Um, these are you know, pre-made in the sense that um, we'll have them prepared and we'll be able to guide you uh, through uh, each step of exploring some of the data and, and the tools. Um, we hope to answer a few questions specifically, you know, the, which Jim just touched on, you know, what combinations are assigned to specific agencies across the southeast, 
uh, what data characterizes you know, these agency lands, um, you know, what options are associated with them, what combinations are associated with them, and the priorities. Um, and we expect, we, we hope that you learn how to use and interpret some of these um, specific belief networks that we'll bring um, to the exercises and uh, the pivot tables and some of the graphics and not only learn how to use them, but, but when. Um, and so it'll be a hands-on experience. We expect um, to have exercises grouped off, you know, a handful of people maybe sharing a computer and working on something together. Um, but you won't be expected to bring any data with you at this point. Or, um, but at the end of the workshop, uh, setting up for the second workshop, we're, we're hoping that um, the participants who've attended can come up with other questions, perhaps get to some more of the specific data that you'd be interested in and integrating with um, the tools that we've developed here for the science analysis and uh, bring those to the next workshop. So the expectations for the second workshop um, is a bit of a more advanced training on how to utilize the data and models more for kind of a custom use. Um, we really want it to be more of a hands-on training um, using more interactive exercises uh, and Hopefully, participants will come from the first workshop with some better ideas of how they could um, integrate some of the data or integrate some specific questions that they may have. Um, each, each of these workshops is going to be two sets of workshops. Again, um, they'll be two days long, um, and this will be a kind of a smaller super user group. Uh, we're capping at about 15 people per session. Um, and those, again, it's, it's those who are interested in more, of getting more of a hands-on experience with the data and really to learn how to customize that, um, some of the tools that we're, we're introducing here with some of the southeastern data that they may have. Um, you know, idea of the agenda for the second workshop is, you know, essentially to how to download and modify the, the master county level data, you know, how to insert and delete data depending on the question you're asking, basically getting better hands on. Um, feel with, with the data sets that we've been using and um, how to interact and use those in, um, in Netica that, and develop and interact with belief network, the belief network. Um, we'll have exercises to show, you know, participants how to ask, or, you know, specific questions in the belief network, teach you some rules of thumb, you know, understand how, how these networks um, uh, are set up and, and perhaps even uh, touching on how to creating a pivot table to, to answer the question you may have. Some of the quick logistics of these workshops. Um, we are saying that we're going to require participants to supply their own travel and accommodations. However, um, Mike Zepko is, uh, has uh, informed us that there is limited grant funding available for state agencies, so contact him if you're to inquire about that. Uh, we would expect you to bring your own personal lap shop, laptop, uh, but we will provide uh, pre-workshop materials, with directions and instructions and everything to expect when you, when you arrive, and you should be able to get that, including on how to download some of the software. Uh, right now, the dates and locations the proposed first workshop series is the week of January 13th. Uh, right now, we're looking at Columbia, South Carolina, and Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, and the second uh, workshop is be later, probably more in April to June, also in the same locations. Um, expect to have an announcement, an invitation at some point soon. We have your emails from this, web, this WebEx. Um, and uh, we will need to collect names of folks who might be attending, uh, who might be interested in attending. Mike um, has suggested perhaps that maybe the R if your agency has an RSC member that is um, associated with this, perhaps he, uh, that person can help collect names and send them to Mike. Um, but be on the lookout for uh, an announcement coming soon. Um, as that, I guess I'll just point it back to questions and see if anybody else has anything else to add. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take us off broadcast mode, so one moment. All participants are now in interactive talk mode. Are there any questions? Karen, I'm, this is David. I may be a little bit confused, but um, for workshop one, is is the date January 13th? It's going to be held in both Columbia and Birmingham on the same day. 
No, it's so basically we're going to have two different workshops, one held in Columbia, one held in Birmingham, not the same day, but within the week of each other. Okay, Dave, we're, we're still confirming locations and what's available. So, you know, for example, one workshop will be Monday, Tuesday, and the other one will be Wednesday, Thursday. Okay. Hi, I'm wondering if um, if you can't attend workshop one, should you not attend workshop two either, or could you do one and not the other? Well, I think the preferable route would be to attend workshop one, but obviously we'll have to work with people's calendars. I mean, if there is a candidate that you know really should be one of these more expert users and they just can't attend one of these workshops, um, you know, we'll just have to work with you on how to maybe bring that person up to speed so that they can be, um, you know, prepared for what's coming up in workshop two. So I guess we'll have to work through those. Um, hopefully there's not very many people that fit into that category, though. Right. The intent is that, it, that, that it's additive. However, if there's somebody with an extremely high aptitude for this type of stuff, um, or they're able to spend time with Jim and his folks, then you know we could we could see how that works. For me, I think I'm going to have to attend all the workshops three times. <laughs> <laughs> Are the other two geographic areas conducting workshops like this concurrently? I, I, uh, no, they're not. I think. There probably are some of the other two RSC uh, groups on this call right now kind of listening and learning, and I know that Danny and Jim have had discussions with some of them to, um, to see how it goes with this process that we've developed here and then, you know, either use it the same or, or refine it or what have you. But uh, there is, there's definitely interest. Um, we just were able to hop on it a little bit quicker and secure uh, some grant funding to help us do some of this. So we're going to send a bill to the other two regions. <laughs> Any other questions about about kind of the upcoming workshops or um, some of the data in particular? Is uh, Jim and Danny anything else that y'all want to add, and then I can kind of do a, a little wrap up? No, other than than thank thanks for for everyone's time. We we realize that you know we're really putting a lot of information out. Um, this is uh, what was intended to be kind of the, the superficial view, and without a lot of deep dive into this information. I mean. And there's a lot of pieces, that, quite honestly, that you'll never see uh, because we sort of went down different pathways. We tried different things. Some of it sort of comes out at the end and think, oh, that's that's really simple. They just did that. And it's like, uh, no, not wasn't quite as simple as it appears sometimes. Uh, there's a lot more behind some of this. And as we get in working with the workshop participants and they want to develop their own sort of classification systems or whatever, there's going to be more nuances that they'll have to appreciate. Um, but um, all that having been said, it, it's really been a, an amazing kind of journey of, of, of plowing our way through all of this information, working with the regional strategy committees, and, and I'll just take this occasion to thank everyone who's participated in those discussions and, and helped us to understand um, the system and to think about how we could be useful in terms of putting an analysis together, and we look forward to, to working with you more. Thanks, Danny. Uh, yeah, I'll just kind of uh, close us out here, but uh, reiterate some of the things that were said and some of the questions or, or statements that were made. Uh, for me, um, it has taken me a while to, to really, well, and I don't even want to claim to have a full handle on this, but I've been fortunate to both at the regional level and at the national level to hear presentations and, and see this process as it's gone forward. And, and you know, I, I've told Danny this before. I was a little bit skeptical. I was like, okay, there's a lot of data and we can use it a lot of different ways, but is it really going to tell us anything different? And I think even in, in the kind of the tickler that some of y'all have seen for the first time today, you can see some things you look and you're like, okay, that's intuitive. I know that. But when you really start looking at how you can evaluate it from a variety of different methods, and for each of us come from a slightly different way of looking at things, 
it really does facilitate a lot of conversation as to what's the not necessarily the best, but what are the different options and what are different opportunities across the landscape. And, you know, we could all go in and look at the county that we live in or a county that we know well and say, well, that's not that's not 100 percent right. And, you know, we've, we've talked through some of that. But when you take it at a multi-county scale, at a state scale, at a regional scale, and, and really start to see some of the trends, it really does inform, uh, you know, the decisions that, that we have to make out there. And, and Again, for each one of us representing different groups or agencies, you start to then be able to see, okay, you know, we might need to look at this a little bit different way, or we might need to dig into this a little deeper. And as, as Jim and Danny both did in kind of deconstructing some of the data, um, you can take it forward and you can take it backwards to, to help you do that. So, you know, again, the intent today was to just introduce some folks that hadn't seen the data. Um, some of what's out there obviously wasn't able to go through all of it. Also introduce you to some of the systems so that within your agency and organization you can make decisions as to who might be most appropriate to go further um, with this. Um, you know, I use Jim and Danny as a resource fairly frequently on when I have questions and they can help me think through some things. So we'll continue to do that at least from a regional level with uh, where I sit as, you know, as chair. Um, but we look forward to moving forward. Um, the names are still up there. If you have any questions, shoot any of us an email or, or pick up the phone and call us. But with that, we'll go ahead and, um, unless we hear somebody say something real quick, we'll go ahead and close it out and just appreciate everybody's time. Thanks, y'all. Thank you all.